Back in November, we brought you an interview with Star Trek Enterprises' John Billingsley and Benita Friderici about the Hollywood Food Coalition. David Livingston, the most prolific director in Star Trek history, is on Hofo Co's board. He joined me recently to talk about beginning his career with Star Trek, transitioning from directing to photography, and Trek Talks 2, Hofo Co's Zoomathon, where you'll see lots of Trek luminaries. Coming to you from COVID quarantine, I'm T. Rick Jones, and this is your Daily Star Trek News. You started out as the unit production manager for Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, how, did, how did you land that gig? Um, <laughs> what does a unit production manager do? Um, uh, and that was sort of the first thing I could find in your career that you did. Is that true? Um, <clears throat> I was doing uh, uh, Movies of the Week uh, at ABC Circle Films, which is a defunct uh, 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 association with ABC. Sure. And that was in January of 87. And uh, the production executive at ABC Circle got a call from Michael Schoenbrunn, who was the head of uh, television production of Paramount, and he was looking for a, a unit production manager to work on the pilot for The Next Generation. And the production executive, Sally Young, recommended me. So I went over and interviewed, and I got the job after uh, interviewing with Michael, uh, Rick Berman, and Bob Justman, who were the supervising producers on The Next Generation at that time. So I started off as the unit production manager uh, on uh, on, on the Star Trek series. Great, and it eventually, ultimately, you started directing. Um, how did that come about? Yeah, <clears throat> I had gone to film school and always wanted to be a director, but uh, I spent a lot of my early career uh, working uh, in production as either an assistant director or a production manager. Production manager, because you asked, uh, is a below the line function who is responsible for hiring uh, and administering the crew uh, and preparing the budget and then uh, uh, executing uh, the budget. Um, uh, but uh, Rick Berman had a, uh, a, a directing school called the DIT School, which was called Director in Training. And very generously, he uh, allowed uh, members of the cast and production staff to apply for a directing uh, slot after they went through DIT school, which was to study uh, the directors that were existing on the show, um, attending production meetings, going to editorial, uh, visiting the set, asking directors questions, doing scene study, various things to show Rick uh, that you were serious about directing and that you uh, that you had the chops to do it. And uh, at some point, uh, Rick would make a determination whether or not he felt you had uh, uh, graduated from DIT school and be able to direct. And thankfully, Rick uh, agreed that I had and gave me the opportunity to start directing. I think it was the fourth season of The Next Generation, which I directed my first episode. Uh, yeah, I believe it was The Mind's Eye, which is right at the end of the fourth season. Correct, mind's uh, eye, yes. That did school, that's that's what Jonathan Frakes basically got him to start that because he wanted to direct as well, right? Yes, he was the first graduate of the school and uh, proved that uh, uh, Rick made the right call because Jonathan's career has proved that it was a, uh, an excellent uh, choice to uh, launch the uh, first graduate of the DIT school. You're the most prolific director in Star Trek history so far. You, directed 62 episodes that's right um so most, the mind's most eye, grateful the mind's eye was your was your first one great episode based on the manchurian candidate did you choose that you wanted to direct that one or did they choose it for you um it's the luck of the draw uh directors are not assigned scripts it's whatever happens to be available uh at, at that part point in the production schedule and when i read it uh exactly that, The Manchurian Candidate. I am a huge fan of the original Manchurian Candidate. I'm a huge fan of John Frankenheimer. I had the privilege of actually meeting him once. Um, 
It's one of my favorite movies. I've seen it many, many, many times. And in my own uh, way, I did an homage, which nobody else probably knows, but I, I tried to recreate one shot from the Manchurian Candidate in the mind's eye where uh, Jordy uh, assassinates a crew member and blows him off his chair and he falls backwards. And it's my uh, homage to a, a shot from, from the original Manchurian Candidate. That shot was completely your own. It wasn't scripted. You, you just wanted to put in a shot from the Manchurian Candidate, right? Yeah, I mean, we were doing Manchurian Candidate, so I said, okay, well, let's let's do a shot from it as well. I don't know, you know, I don't know how many people recognize it, but I do, so um, it, it was more for my benefit than anybody else. You did a couple of episodes of Next Generation, and then you did a bunch of episodes of Deep Space Nine, and the first episode you did, I think, was the Nagus, um, and that... That, in my mind, it was the first episode where the Ferengi start to, started to get a bit interesting. Um, and I could see, okay, they're going to take the Ferengi some interesting places. Now, you pitched that episode, but not quite that way. It wasn't a Ferengi-based episode when you pitched it, right? <laughs> um, I pitched many, many, many story ideas to Star Trek. And being uh, on the production staff as a producer... Uh, it kind of forced the writers to read what I sent them. Um, fortunately, you know, I, I mean, I had an in. Come on, I had an office next to Rick Berman. But uh, I, they, they bought two of my stories. Uh, one was not produced. Uh, it was a story about uh, Mrs. Troy and Data uh, being trapped in a shuttle together and having to work together to see if they could survive. Uh, they, they, uh, they didn't end up uh, writing that one, but. Uh, the other story was where uh, it was a, uh, the A story was about Quark as a businessman. And I don't even remember what my plot was. And the B story was uh, Jake teaching Nog how to read. They bought the story based upon the B story. And when I went to the story break, which is where the writers all get together in a room and there's a big whiteboard, which one of the writers will write down all the beats and the scenes of the, of the script. In that meeting, uh, they said, okay, we've got this B story. That's clear, that'll work, fine. But David's A story about Quark being a businessman doesn't work. What are we gonna do? And Michael Piller raised his hand and said, let's do The Godfather. And everybody went, whoa, yeah, let's do The Godfather. And he turned to uh, Ira Bear and said, Ira, this weekend, write The Godfather. And that Monday, uh, I was handed The Godfather, and uh, to my Im immense pleasure, because again, that's one of my, well, my two favorite movies, Godfather 1 and 2, and I had died and gone to heaven, because to have Quark be able to play Marlon Brando was a real treat. We actually did uh, the opening scene of, of Brando in his office. We recreated it, tried to, as an homage uh, where Quark is in his office and uh, um, the guy comes entreating uh, Quark for favors, which was our recreation of that of that scene. Yeah. So it was it was a great thrill uh, to be able to do that and and uh, and Ira generously gave me story credit, which I did not wholly deserve, but I, I was perfectly willing to accept. So it was very <laughs> it was very gracious of him to to do that. No horse head though. No horse head, uh, which would have been cool. I, I think that would have been great if Quark could have uncovered something under his under his uh, covers, uh, but uh, they, they chose not to do that particular beat. That would have been great. Maybe a targ head or something. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> uh, was Wallace Shawn always the choice? Was it written for Wallace Shawn to be the, uh, the Nagus or did he audition? How did he end up in that role? Because he's perfect for it. I mean, he basically... He could be a Ferengi in real life. He's, you know, I think he's yeah. wonderful, but he's perfect. He's got the perfect build, perfect voice and everything. No, well, Sean is a Ferengi. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, we were in casting and we were having a lot of trouble figuring out who was going to be the Nagus because very special, very special character. <laughs> and I was sitting next to Rick in the casting session and with Junie Lowry and whoever else was in the room. 
And Rick, it just comes out of his mouth. What about Wallace Shawn? And everybody went, well, of course, Wallace Shawn. <laughs> so he didn't have to, uh, he didn't have to audition or anything. He was just offered the part and uh, the, uh, the rest is history. He's, he was perfect for it. Just mm -hmm. as, just as Armin Shimmerman is the perfect quark, uh, uh, Wallace Shawn is the, is the perfect uh, Grand Nagus. The B plot, I love that B plot. It's, um, it's really touching um, and it gets me every time. Um, you know, Cisco's, Cisco's trying to keep Jake and Nog away from each other. And then he, find, he goes to punish him for disobeying him and then finds out that Jake's teaching him to read because he was kicked out of school. I just think it's a it's a lovely lovely plot. So um, well done. I really really enjoy it. Yeah, thank you. Well, it, again, it's all in the writing. I just I just get to sit there and make pictures out of it. But but Aaron and Sirach were so wonderful together. I got to do a couple of things with them, and and I love those moments of them sitting up on the second floor of the promenade, uh, discussing life and yeah. and uh, w watching the women p pass by underneath them. Um, so, uh, I, I got a, I got a big kick out of that. And, and Aaron is, is sorely missed, uh, for the audience that doesn't know, uh, Aaron died last year. Um, and he, he was, he was a special guy, a very giving, uh, person, uh, in real life. And as an actor, uh, he would do anything for you. Yeah. It's, it's a great regret of mine that I never got to talk to him. I would have, I would have liked to have gotten to know him because. Yeah. He was, he was a special guy. Yeah. Do you have any favorite episodes that you directed? Um, the, my favorite episodes are those when we either got off the shape uh, the ship or we, we went back uh, into an alternate universe. Uh, we came to earth. Uh, those are my favorite because you really got to open up uh, the story. You got to see the, a lot of times you got to see the cast play uh, against their, their type or against their character or play an alternate uh, character. Um, so, so those are my favorite. Um, uh, I, on, the, on Enterprise, for instance, I did an episode called Impulse, which yeah. was basically a zombie episode and it was great to see Vulcans, who are supposedly these staid controlled creatures, uh, be zombified where they go totally against type. And, jo and to have Jolene be totally out of control and, and this mad woman <coughs> was, really, it was really a lot of fun. And yeah. visually, I got to shoot a horror movie. It was, not a, it was not a Star Trek science fiction show. It was a, it was a zombie episode. So yeah. those are the kinds of, of things that, that I liked. Uh, I, I like to do. You you still keep keep abreast. You you still go to trek conventions and things like that. Um, are one of one of the people that works for Daily Star Trek News, Marina Kravchuk. She's our events coordinator, um, and uh, she loves seeing you at these conventions. Um, you know, she goes to every convention she can, um, and she she loves it when you're there, and and she gets to see you. Uh, she was wondering, she asked me to ask you if um, if you keep atop of any of the current shows, uh, the modern Trek at all. Do you know any of those? Do you watch any of those? Um, I do not, um, but it's, uh, I, I have to admit, I'm not a science fiction, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dystopic science fiction fan. Okay. Uh, Blade Runner is, is my choice of, of science fiction. Um, Gene Roddenberry's uh, vision of the future was totally opposite of, of, of Blade Runner. He had this positive view of what the future will be and that mankind is gonna come out on the positive side. And that's why after how many decades uh, it resonates with so many people and why people do go to the conventions. And I am immensely grateful for the opportunity to, to participate in that in that world, and and uh, uh, you know, it, it's great to hear that that people uh, come to these conventions to to hear us old fogies talk about to talk about the past. So it, it's 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 really it's really a gift. But uh, I, I I actually don't watch uh, the current iterations. Yeah. Over the years and decades, you've moved more into photography. Do you do any more directing, or is it is it all photography all the time now? 
It's all photography. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm an entertainment photographer for Getty Images, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a website that uh, syndicates photos. So how did you get, how did you get involved in photography and why, why did you switch from directing to photography? Um, I have always loved photography and when digital photography came into being at the, the turn of the century, um, I, I was always frustrated by having to deal with the lab and, and the cost of printing and the fact that, you know, you were limited on how many shots you can do on the camera before you had to change roles and stuff. And then I got a, a Canon Digital Rebel around the turn of the century. And it changed my life in terms of my view of photography because it opened up so many opportunities and, and cost-saving measures where basically you can do everything yourself. And I do it with Photoshop and, and, uh, and my, my Canon uh, cameras and lenses and uh, I, I do everything self-contained. I do my own printing here on my, on my Epson, Epson printer. So uh, I can do so much more. So it freed me to say I'm not limited by the technical limitations or financial limitations that existed uh, in the old days where you had to deal with sprockets. Um, so from that point on, I started doing a lot of personal photography. I then uh, got involved in shooting editorial uh, to make money, but kept up my personal work as well. And uh, with my personal work, I've had several photo exhibits. I have a website where I, where I attempt to sell photographs. So it's really become my, my passion. And I've had passion projects uh, over the years as well. I just recently completed a uh, photographic exhibit uh, done exclusively on my iPhone, which is a a great photographic instrument uh, about the homeless and uh, 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 of Los Angeles. And I had a couple of exhibits of those uh, prior to COVID in association with the Hollywood Food Coalition where I'm a member of the board of directors. Um, so that, that was a passion project. So photography is really, is really my passion now. You sent me the whole exhibit, the Still Lives exhibit, which is the one you did on your iPhone. They're gorgeous pictures. Thank you. The first thing that struck me looking at the at the photos was um, they're so colorful. Um, it actually, all, at first, I I thought I was like it belies it sort of belies the serious nature of the of the photos. But as I looked at them more, I was like, no, it actually helps complement them. You know, another photographer might do all black and whites, and there are a few black and whites in there, but um, but you made them like uber colorful and beautiful. Uh, what, what led to that choice? Uh, your reaction is very similar to a lot of people where they first think that I'm presenting these people in an unrealistic light because of the saturation and vibrance that you pointed out. First thing is that's how I see things. I see things in that world of color. It's what affects me the most. And my thought was, and the reason that I did this to all of these, all of these people was I wanted to show them that they live vibrant lives as well as we do. And that to portray them in dreary, depressed circumstances is not how I saw them. They are living, vibrant human beings. <laughs> and I had so many conversations with, with them fascinating individuals who just happen because of their given circumstances to not have the opportunities that we have had or have fallen off uh, out of society or whatever. But when you talk to them and you engage them, you find out that they're fascinating people and, and no different than we are. And they're struggling and trying just as all the rest of, of us are. So it was my way to say, hey, we walk by them all the, all the time and we don't pay any attention to them. And, and we reject them. And that's what I did initially until I started photographing them. And I said, these people are really beautiful. How can I make them beautiful to the audience so that, we'll, that it will draw the eye to them rather than away from them? And to your point where you said initially it looked like it was off-putting, but eventually you were drawn to it. That was exactly my intention, that the color was to 
bring the audience to their faces. And uh, I think generally I was successful and most people, most people got it. Most people got it. It was not meant to be in any way, shape or form exploitative. It was meant to respect, uh, to show respect for them and to show that they have uh, lives as rich and as well, they're not necessarily rich, but as, as important as we are as well. Sure. Um, and they're striking photos. Um, you know, they're sad, but some, sometimes there's, you look at somebody and like, they look really happy despite their circumstances or they have a beautiful smile. Um, there's, there's one, um, there's a, a guy sitting against a wall with his head down, he's got long hair, um, immediately made me think of Jesus. He looked a little Jesus-like uh, sitting there in just despair. And that may have been the t your title for the photo, Despair. Beautiful photo, very striking. Um, and there are a lot that where you've got like close-ups of their faces. And this was all done on an iPhone XS, um, which, you know, the, the iPhone's a great camera. I use my iPhone camera a lot too. Um, but it just shows that you have a good camera in your hand and somebody who knows how to use it. And you can get these amazing photographs. Um, and you've got some photos, you get so close, you can see the lines on people's faces and they're just striking, beautiful photos. Um, that, thank you. Um, uh, the iPhone is, I, I shoot Canon professionally, but to me, the iPhone is the greatest photographic instrument ever invented, especially for street photography, because it's just, it's, it's so small and it's not intrusive. My, my Canon cameras are four times as large and weigh six times as, 10 times as much as the iPhone. Um, but it allowed me to get intimate with the camera without uh, threatening uh, or off-putting the subject generally, generally. I could not have done the exhibit uh, without the iPhone. While you were doing this project, you met a lot of these people. You didn't just go and quick snap a picture and run away. You actually talked to them. Um, there are some there are some stories uh, throughout. You tell the stories of certain people. Um, there's one woman who would pick up garbage just because the street is her home. So keep it keep it clean. Um, what do you have? Did you have uh, somebody who was particularly interesting or a couple of favorite stories you learned or touching stories you, you heard that, that you could share? Uh, yeah, again, uh, I, I accompanied a, a lot of the photographs with these, with these short stories about, about the interactions. And um, uh, one guy, I forgot the cat's name, but one guy had a cat uh, and I said, what's the cat's name? And he said, the cat's name was A or something like that. And I said, what's your name? And he says, my name's also A. Uh, so he had the same name as his cat, which to me was so touching. And the cat was beautiful in the way that he held the cat to him. Uh, it, was, it was so touching and, and, and genuine and, and beautiful. Um, but a, a lot of those kinds of stories. The, the, again, the picture of the woman, I did a whole series of this woman picking up uh, the garbage on the street and she didn't have any place to live, but the street was her home and, and she was picking up the garbage and putting it into, into bins. Um, she had pride, she had no home, but she had pride in, 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 yeah, in her yeah. life. Uh, and, uh, one woman, uh, I don't know if I put a story about it, but, but after I photographed her, uh, when I was leaving, she said, I just wanted to say thank you. And because I thanked her and she says, no, I want to thank you. And I said, why? And she said, for talking to me, <laughs> not for photographing her, but for talking to her, because wow. so many people would just walk by and not even uh, acknowledge that she existed. But she was grateful that somebody took the time to actually communicate with her. Yeah. And that just blew me away. And uh, th there was many examples of that where the people were just grateful to have a connection uh, with somebody else instead of li living these quiet lives of solitude. As, again, I call the exhibit still lives because so many of them do live in this still world and 
to be able to enter it and to engage them and to get get them out of that stillness for even a couple of moments uh, yeah, yeah. was so fulfilling to me, but but also to them. And is there some place uh, that people watching can see the whole exhibit? Uh, gee, actually, they'd have to uh, uh, go to my uh, um, Apple Photos uh, shared library. Okay. Uh, but if you want to, if you want to share my email, uh, or I can tell you that people can write me, and then I can uh, invite them uh, to that shared folder. Uh, where they can look at the exhibit on on Apple Photos. Okay, if you're okay with it, I'll put your email in the show notes. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah, I, right. I would be pleased to do that. I, um, it's not an ego thing. It's about increasing people's awareness about a, a horrible situation in our society where there are so many people that are unrecognized and that we're not we're not dealing with with the situation to help them out. But one of my reasons for doing this whole thing was to create awareness so that the people who have fallen off of, out of society can climb back in. Sure. A lot of people can't be because of drug addiction or mental illness or whatever. Um, so we have to take care of them in some way. But there are also people who, because of their particular circumstances, have just kind of lost it. And we can help them regain and become productive members of society. How wonderful would it be instead of having the taxpayer have to subsidize somebody who can't get a job, instead helping that person get back in society and get a job and become productive again and start paying taxes themselves. That's, that's what I am trying to do with it, to help raise consciousness to get people back as product, as many of these people as back as productive members of society, and to take care of those who are incapable of taking care of themselves. That's that's a responsibility uh, of ours as a society. Yeah, and as you know, uh, back right before Thanksgiving, I talked to John Billingsley and Benita Friderici um, about the Hollywood Food Coalition, um, and John actually is the one who got got. Uh, you and I in touch with each other. Um, just for anybody who missed that interview, um, Hollywood Food Coalition is um, an organization in Hollywood uh, that does um, uh, paper bag lunches for for the homeless. But they're you're branching out, right? Now you're you're going to start doing full dinners. Do I have that right? Well, actually, uh, for many many years, we have served a nightly meal. Um, it was a takeaway uh, uh, meal uh, during COVID. We hope to get back to a sit-down meal eventually where we serve possibly hundreds of people uh, a night. Um, that's one of our uh, uh, parts of the organization. Another part is um, our exchange program where we take in contributed food and uh, then redistribute it to organizations all around Southern California to service uh, their needs to serve uh, uh, meals to the homeless, as well as providing uh, food to our uh, nightly meal service. And you mentioned our lunch bag programs. Uh, Bonnie uh, set up this program called the Sunday Lunch Bag Program, where families would make uh, uh, lunches and put them into lunch bags with designs on them, with uh, uh, with with putting toys and stuff in it as as well as a dessert. And at the at the height of COVID, on a Sunday, we were distributing seven thousand plus lunch bags to the uh, to the uh, Southern California community, which was an extraordinary program and is ongoing. So we have a lot of different parts to the organization. We also have a social service component. Uh, we have a medical uh, facilities component. The uh, uh, UCLA Medical uh, uh, Mobile Clinic comes once a week. We have an eye clinic. We have a dental clinic. We have so many different uh, cohorts uh, associated with it. And we're growing by leaps and bounds. And uh, uh, the only thing that's currently holding us back is our own permanent home and the money to be able to establish it. So uh, one thing we're doing is, is trying to raise as, as much money, especially this coming year, so that we can uh, establish our own home. 
and under roof, one roof provide all these uh, meal services and social uh, service uh, services uh, as well to the uh, uh, to the unhoused uh, and needy uh, populations of, of Los Angeles. And in, re in that regard, we have a lot of fundraisers uh, that we've been launching each year. And one of the fundraisers was something that John and I uh, launched last year with our other partners called Trek Talks, in which we uh, garnered and, and uh, corralled a lot of our Star Trek buddies to, produce, to participate in a six hour Zoomathon uh, called Trek Talks, which we had last January. And we're, we're repeating it this year again called Trek Talks 2. Uh, so visit trektalks.net if you want to get more information and to join us on January 14th at 10 a.m. Uh, uh, Pacific Standard Time. And we're going to have an eight hour uh, Zoomathon, which with a great group of guests, we have Scott Bakula, Anson Mount, Jonathan Frakes, Brent Spiner, Will Wheaton. Uh, just to name a, a few of the of the uh, of, of the Star Trek uh, universe that's going to be uh, appearing. So, uh, if people, if the Star Trek fans are interested out there, please join us on on the 14th. And uh, uh, if if you want to contribute something, please financially, please do. But more than anything, we have this thing called Trektivism, where we're trying to motivate those in the in the Trek community to take the ethos that Gene Roddenberry set up in, in the 1960s about uh, mankind coming out on the positive end of things and saying to, to those members of the Star Trek community, practice what you see on Star Trek, and that is to give back to your community. Go out and do something to help somebody else. Show that mankind is okay and that we are a positive, uh, that things are going to turn out positive. That it's not going to turn out like Blade Runner, even though I love the film. <laughs> that, that, that man, that man is really going to, uh, to to step up and 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 take care of things. So uh, Trek Talks too. I keep saying it over and over again, but it's trektalks.net. And please join us on the 14th if you can. Yeah, I, I will be there. And just to give them their due, it was um, uh, the Sci-Fi Sisters. And Trek Geeks? Trek Geeks, Trek Geeks are the producing partner. They're really the force behind the whole thing, as well as the Roddenberry Foundation. They're the other producing element. So John and I, and especially John, set this thing going. But Trek Geeks have really been the huge mo uh, driving fo force along with, uh, with the Roddenberry organization and the Sci-Fi Sisters. Uh, who have been wonderful. I, I, did a, uh, I did a talk with them yesterday and they are the most wonderful group of, of Star Trek fans and, and they are associated with the Trek Geeks as well. And they're actually, they actually did the intro to Trek Talks last year and they're gonna do the intro again this year and they're gonna have a special panel as well. I won't do a spoiler alert about it, but, but their subject is going to be uh, quite compelling and people who are fans or even not fans of sci-fi sisters should definitely attend uh, uh, Trek Talks 2 to see what to see what they're going to talk about. A little bit of spoiler alert. I'll just say Nichelle Nichols. So that'll be a oh, wow. sort of a little idea of, of what they're going to be dealing with. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And it's going to be panels. It's going to be interviews. Um, it's going to be different, different Trek related subjects. Is that right? I yes, we're going to have... Uh, Musical entertainment. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Will uh, Will Wheaton is doing a very uh, uh, special bit, uh, which I hope the audience will get a big kick out of. Which he and John, uh, which uh, so uh, look for that. Uh, and uh, as you said, a lot of interviews, one on ones, uh, group panels. Um, I think we're going to be publishing a run of the show uh, in the next week or so. So, so people can get an idea of, of exactly what's going to be to be occurring. Uh, so that's great. It, it should it should be a blast. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm going to be there for as much as I can of it. I don't know if I can get there for the whole thing, but I'll be there for okay. a Ter ter Terrific. Good. We look forward to seeing you. And I'll, I'll put the link in the show notes as well below um, so yeah. that people can find them. That would be wonderful. So 
Um, well, David Livingston, thank you so much for joining me. This has been wonderful. I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, you've been very generous with your time and your answers. Um, and uh, we'll see you. We'll see you at Trek uh, Trek Talks too this week. Great, thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. My pleasure. Okay. Have a great day. You too. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye.